So I understand there is a theater in town, a healthy theater now. Uh, I don't know when the last movie that I watched was. I think it would, maybe it was Help, which just is a long time ago. So it's been a while since I've been in a theater. But I assume some of you have been keeping up with the best summer blockbusters and the movie sequels. Um, for, for my money, Batman was the best series out there. I'm telling you, if you've watched the last three Batman, you're going to understand about 75% of what I believe about God and life and fear and joy and all that other stuff. But if you're not into Batman, uh, who here would think that Star Wars is the best of the series? A couple quick hands. There's one in the back there. What about uh, Indiana Jones? You can't vote twice, Wes. (laughs) What about uh, Toy Story? Anyone think Toy Story, the three Toy Stories? Oh, lot of tears. Yeah, yeah, these guys. What about First and Second Kings? That was a blockbuster. It is, it is. There's a story in there, one of my favorites, because I like bears and bears tend to like me. There's a story in there about a bunch of teenagers who are picking on their youth pastor for losing his hair. And they laugh at him and say, ha ha, you're bald. And so the guy, what he does is he asks God to send down a bear to maul the children. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's just a great book. It's so exciting, and there's, there's <laughs> violence and excitement and swords and sex and villains and heroes and mystery and all those things. It's way better than most of the movies they make today. The Bible is actually full of, of sequels and blockbusters like this. Uh, I'm sure you, you're familiar with First and Second Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. I'm sure many of you at your weddings had those words read. Or the first five books of the Bible are really kind of a series, kind of, a, uh, kind of like Indiana Jones, a whole bunch of them. The third one's really not all that exciting in the first five books, but it's there. Other sequels are a little less obvious in the Bible. So Luke and Acts, those are sequels. Those are written by the same person, and that's not just a, a controversial claim that you know, scholars say. That's the kind of thing that even like comb over radio pastors will say, that they're all written by the same guy, those two. And so when we read the scenes today from very diverse kind of places in the Bible, it really was like taking a scene from this movie and then a scene from its sequel and a scene from its sequel and just jamming those all together. Uh, when Frank and I were doing that, it's just a glimpse for you to see not so much the progression of any themes, I guess, but, but maybe the characters and and maybe just a, uh, a sense of how the early church started to develop. Scene one, with all the miraculous fish. The disciples are just blown away. This guy, he's the best fisherman ever, and he talks like Yoda. I kind of picture Simon in there looking like Keanu Reeves, just kind of this dumb look on his face. <laughs> he's really genuine. He knows there's something special. He's just not sure what's going on. He, d- he doesn't have a clue who this Jesus guy is or what he's up to, but something is kind of moving inside, and he's going to follow this guy. He's going to listen to him. Scene two, Jesus is teaching, and the disciples have no idea what he's talking about, which happens over and over and over throughout the Gospels. And it isn't that they are dumb. It isn't that they are lazy. It's just that they are so used to a world where things work according to what you earn and and what what you kind of deserve. And Jesus keeps talking about a new world where the world works in cooperation and in sharing. And the disciples kind of tilt their head like that dog who doesn't know what that is, but is interested. So they had a feeling first, and now they're starting to be interested in the message. They want to know more. So scene three. Here is Simon, Peter, of all people, preaching, and the miracle is is that he starts to sound like he knows what he's talking about. Three years of mission, three years hanging out with Jesus, three years of learning with him, three times denying him, three times being very confused on a beach after Jesus rose again. But now Peter is starting to see something. He's starting to awake to this message. And we don't know yet if it's translated from his head down to his heart, but he's got something. Something's bubbling up there, some kind of passion to live and to share the gospel. And scene four, where all those people were all gathered together, just filling out the pews, having to set up, you know, first century versions of chairs in the back and all that stuff. Don't idealize these people. These are not perfect people coming together to worship. They're just like us. They're stumbling through this Jesus thing. But for this moment, for this season of their lives, a lot of them are coming together for worship. And and that wasn't the goal. They're just, they're doing the right things. They're joining in community and, and it grew. And they were asking questions 
about God. And they were hanging out and eating together and reading scripture together and helping each other and serving their neighbors. And they were just trying to live according to the example of Jesus. And lo and behold, they were changed, their neighbors were changed, and the world started to change little by little. One of those scenes, I think, you fit in. Somewhere between feeling, some feeling in you that God is in your life. Or maybe you're interested. You're interested in learning more about it. Or maybe you're passionate and committed. And and maybe you've really got it figured out and you're here to be part of something. Somewhere, I think, we're all in one of those scenes. And we might go back to another scene for a while. We might jump forward to another scene for a while. But I think we're all aiming toward that last one when we're all together. And for the disciples, as they, as they progressed through that, worship had been something meaningful, maybe. It may have been something routine, either way. But at this part of their journey, what we just read, something clicked. And now they just can't even wait to come together. They're just bursting at the seams to come and praise and sing and rejoice. They had known Jesus. They had known something about him. They could have told you what he was capable of doing. But now a switch had been turned on. They can't believe what they didn't know before. They're thirsty to learn everything they can about God. They had been close friends for years, like a family. They laughed a lot around the table. But like some light had turned on, now they are close and they are helping each other and they are comforting each other and they are celebrating with each other. They had done plenty of good things. These were great guys. They spent a lot of time doing good things and serving people, but now, like they woke up, they could not rest without transforming their world around them. Don't idealize these guys. Very normal, regular people. Most of them were teenagers. Most of them were young men. When you read those names, that's what you should look at, is guys that age. And not me. Jesus was younger than me. So the guys he drew were even younger than that. Regular guys, and you know, they're young guys. They could have done anything. They could have kept fishing. They could have got a job. They could have found a wife. They could have been a shepherd. They could have done anything. And then something happened, and their souls were awakened to new life and new faith and a new world. And we want to know, if you're here, I think, if you're here today, you want to know, how can we do that? How can we awaken to the kind of life that the disciples felt? What has to happen in our souls for us to feel that? What would it be like to really feel like our eyes were opened with God? What would it be like to live a life toward Jesus? What would it be like to just be so deeply spiritual that our joys and our worries and our pains and our adventures and frustrations and despair were all just jammed together into God's hands? So what would it be like if your soul was awakened to God? Some of you, let's take uh, this, group, this group right here. Some of you, let's be honest, generally are dragged here to church. Or maybe you were when you were younger, and you remember what that's like. You were dragged here to church. Uh, Today, you know, there's a potluck, so maybe you came for the potluck. (laughs) But generally, you know, there's just so many other things you can do with your time. You don't understand the big fuss about church. Other people, that's fine for them. You're not going to be judgmental. But worship is boring, and all the Christians I see on TV are just doing something kind of wrong, and you just don't have any interest in this part of your life. If that's you, don't nod because it'd be an awkward lunch to sit next to you. (laughs) But really, if you resonate with that perspective, some of you probably do, at the very least, you can probably see why Jesus is an interesting character. Or you might be willing to take part in some kind of a service to the world, because anyone does that. You might even go so far as to read a book that comes off the spirituality shelf. You probably don't want to be lumped into the loonies who have uh, angels and talking snakes and everything. But... If you, whoever you are, if you and I can meet somewhere in the middle, let me rephrase the question. What would it be like if life started to make more sense? What would it be like for you if there seemed to be a reason why things happened, even for your life to have a purpose and a depth to it? We don't need to call it God. We don't need to use the word church. Not yet. But what would it be like for you in this group if you just felt connected and meaningful and had a reason to be your best self? Now to this group over here, others of you are on a rampage for Jesus. You're just so excited. Can I please just be on another committee and sing in this big choir? And I can't wait to read the new Reza Aslan book. You know, I never even heard of him until Fox News said something dumb, but now I want to read it. 
some of us are just so jazzed by God and even by this church and we take it home and we put it on Facebook and we can't wait until someone inspires us, until we can inspire someone else, else to be the disciples that they can be and that we can be. And you people in this kind of circle here, you know of those four scenes that we went through there, you know that of those four scenes, faith is not a simple kumbaya, church comes together, perfect community of people. You know better than anyone that we live out our personal journey with God in ups and downs and in despair and in adventure. And you know that when we live that together, it can be a hot mess. And we jam all this together, all kinds of people on their journey with God. It's never going to be perfect. If you think this church, any church you've been in, has ever been a mess, say amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's you people in this group, the ones that are most after God's heart, the ones who are most committed to this family, you know more than anyone that it's in that mess that God awakens your soul. And it's in that mess when your soul is awakened that that can spread to a town and that can spread to a region, that can spread to a world. If anyone's ever been inspired by this church or any church they've been in, say amen. Amen. Just as loud. But how about the middle? Because some of you are here. Some of you are there, some of you are there, but some of you are here. What would it be like for God to inspire and awaken your soul. Some of us, you know, we're, we're interested. Most of us who come to this room with any regularity, most of us are somewhere in this middle. Some discipleship, some hesitation. Some moments where life feels like it's on a mountaintop of faith, and other moments where we just assume to kind of keep, our, keep ourselves under control. We believe in God, whatever that means, we belong to a church when we want to. We have questions, but we rarely bother to ask them. We give and we do, but we can't really imagine what life would be like if God's kingdom really were here. I sense for some people in this room and in churches all over the world, when you ask, what would it be like for God to awaken your soul, the answer, the honest answer would be, eh, kind of a hassle. Really? Yeah, God is good and all. But are you really ready to, 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 to get rid of the comfortable life that you have? To, you don't want to do all of this stuff over here. You don't want to stop doing this stuff over here. Right now, even if the Spirit of God came down into your life and tried to awaken your soul, maybe a kind of a yawnish acknowledgement. Here's the thing. That's okay. Even in the middle. Even if you have those woozy eyes for God, that's okay. That's the scene you are in today, and I'm not going to force you to move forward. But I would like to offer you a glimpse. That's what I think my job is as a pastor, is to offer you a glimpse of what it could be like to take that next step forward. And I'm not going to offer you a glimpse of my imagination, because I don't know you all yet. So I'm really just going to help you to imagine your own image of what life would be like if you found a deep relationship, a deeper relationship with your maker. And whatever stress or difficulties you have in life... What would it be like if you just let God take on one thing? And I'm not talking about a big thing. We're not going to start there. We're not going to give God our depression, our alcoholism, our loneliness, our cancer. Just, just hang on to those for a second. What would it be like if you could just follow God enough that when you walked outside today, you looked at the sky for another second or two and appreciated what it was? You paused a little bit in traffic and let someone go by. You just decided to gossip a little less or maybe to drive a little friendlier to not be frustrated when someone at work says something stupid. Imagine what it would be like not to get as angry at your wife or your husband or your kids. Whatever it is in your life, some small thing, just imagine that first step on your journey. Just think about it, and after that, you and God can take care of the pace and whatever the next step is. What would it be like for God to awaken your soul, to just rub your eyes awake? Whether you are spiritual but not religious, or you can't even handle that title, whether you're a pillar of the church that... People ask you to pray at every meal. And whether you're somewhere in between, no matter where you are, this is my message for you. I believe this. I'm convinced of it. I can, can't prove it, but I can argue it. I might be wrong, but I feel it kind of deep in my bones. And this is what Jesus told this message. He, he said this to a crazy group of people. He said it to a group just like Netherlands. A group of teenagers who were lost, a group of accountants. He said it to doctors, to radicals, to people who fight for the right to carry swords, in the same group as people who wanted nothing but peace, he, fought, he taught this to faithful Jews, to faithful non-Jews, to rich 
young men to rich old women to poor everybody. He reached out to people at every stage and shape of life, and he said, this is what he said, he said, follow me, and I'll awaken something in here. That's, that's how, as, as much as I can boil it down. Follow me, and I'm going to do something to your heart. You fill in with something. Just open yourself up to the possibility that life with God offers you something, a feeling, an interest, a passion, a life lived together. Follow me, and I promise, Jesus says, I promise that I'll start to change you. I don't know what that follow me means for you. For some people, it means running toward Jesus by changing your job and changing your life and your friends and everybody. For some of you, if you're walking that way and Jesus says, follow me that way, all it means is to kind of stop for a second and let those words echo as you wait to hear more. But whatever it means, that's the first word Jesus says to the people who are going to stumble behind him. He says, follow me. And whatever it is that God might change here in this place, whatever God might awaken in your soul, all of us have room to live that a little more deeply, to live a little better for ourselves and for our world. We can all discover God's presence closer and feel God's love more purely and experience the truth of God's grace, follow Jesus' example a little closer. All of us can wake to the beauty and joy of living in God and transforming our lives and transforming God's world. And so whatever people say Jesus did for them and whatever God can do for you, let's put it in the words of the song that you guys read this morning. The song said, you were made to meet your maker. And Jesus says pretty much the same thing. You were made to follow me. That's what you're here for. And whatever you are in life or wherever you are in this church or with another church or with no church, with with God, with no God, whatever you feel, wherever you are, that's the promise. That's simple. Jesus says, follow me. I will awaken something in your heart. Follow me one step, however it feels right. And I will awaken your soul. I promise. Amen.